Hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's online service. Yes, and as always, we give a special welcome to everyone joining us from different nations, and particularly to all of you in King's Church International in Windsor and in London and in, in Robertson, South Africa. Well, it's good, really good to be able to meet together in person again in different locations, but also to continue with this online ministry. Last Sunday, as an alternative to Halloween, KCI London hosted a very special light party, which we will be showing some clips of a little later on. And apart from all the joyful celebrations, it really was a great evening of celebration. I, like everybody else, was very impressed with the translation skills of my wife. Remember, when we got married, <laughs> neither of us really spoke each other's language. Yes, I am amazed how God has helped me to learn English when it was such a big challenge. And it is very special to see now the Lord is helping us to reach out to Hispanics in London. Many of them, we have discovered, they live very near to where we meet in Westminster. We really encourage you all to pray, to pray with us every day that God will help us and so many other faithful churches to light up the great city of London with the gospel. London, of course, is a governmental city as well as being a large international multi-ethnic city. It's a city of great governmental influence. And today's theme is how to speak truth to power. Our speakers today are Mike and Natasha Airy, members of our leadership team who have been involved in politics for many years. And they will be applying some of the very important teachings from the book of Acts as we continue our studies today at the point where the Apostle Paul was brought before earthly rulers and needed to give an account of his actions and his faith. Yes, all this took place in the city of Caesarea, where we will have a feature on in this program. We uh, will also have a sobering and inspiring report of 2,000 pastors who stood against the evil policies of a government that wanted to remove real Christianity in Britain. But first, we need to pray. Let's pray together. Amen. Please bow your heads whatever has been going on just before this program or in your life, let's take a moment that in this service we ask the Holy Spirit to come to really speak to us, to minister to us and to change us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the ruler of the nations and that you have the power to raise up and to remove kings and kingdoms. We thank you, Lord, for all the freedoms that we enjoy. And we pray that you will help us today to really understand how we can and how we must advance the kingdom of God in all areas of life, throughout society and in government. Please help us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to know the light of Christ in our hearts and to shine your light wherever we are. Also, Lord, please, personally draw near to us that we would be aware in a new way today of your presence and of your great love. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. into the wild and don't be afraid run into our open spaces graces waiting for you dance like the wings are lifted graces waiting where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there 
will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Life's made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Chains will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name.
Titus 3 verse 1 Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and the authority to be the obtained, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one to be peaceable and considerate and always to gentle towards everyone Romans chapter 13 verse 1 Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established The authorities that exist have been established by God Hebrews 13 verse 17 Have confidence in your leaders and submit to the authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. 1 Peter 2 verse 13 to 14 Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors, who are sent to him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have brought you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Hi all, it's Shahana here, and it was such a privilege last Sunday evening to be with King's Church International in London for celebrating the light event. It was such a great service at the Emmanuel Centre in Westminster and quite a party at the end. We had lots of people, new people, and it was a great atmosphere as younger and older, Anglos and Hispanic celebrated Jesus as the light of the world. Here are some clips to give you a flavour of what's hotting up in London. This evening we're going to worship the Lord 
Y esta noche vamos a adorar al Señor. Vamos a oír algunas historias de cómo el Señor cambió las vidas de algunas personas. Y bueno, aquí vamos a desde aquí vamos a alumbrar a Londres. Wow, this really was an amazing time. And now we'd also like to invite you to another special service at the Emmanuel Centre in London, coming up next Sunday, November the 14th. It's called Surprise by Love. And there will be a big focus on romance with the true life stories, great teaching and worship. It starts at 5 p.m. Please come if you can. And everyone, please pray for the light of God to shine more brightly in London. Christian freedoms in the UK have been won at great cost. Over 360 years ago, gospel preachers and churches faced vicious opposition from the state. Following the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II in 1660, a punitive anti-Puritan reign commenced leading to legislation which became known as the Clarendon Code. Four penal measures, the Corporation Act, the Act of Uniformity, the Conventicle Act, the Five Mile Act, stabbed at the heart of Puritan legislation, religion, education and culture. Together, they tragically helped to paganise the 18th century church and people. The Corporation Act of 1661 was designed for the express purpose of restricting public offices in England to members of the Church of England. It provided that no person could be legally elected to any office relating to the government of a city or corporation unless he had received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper according to the rights of the Church of England within the previous 12 months. They were further commanded to swear loyalty to the King, swear a belief in the doctrine of passive obedience, and to renounce the covenant, which had been drawn up to preserve the Reformation in England. In 1662, Parliament passed the Act of Uniformity, which enforced the Book of Common Prayer, prescribing the form of public prayers, administration of sacraments, and other rights of the established Church of England. Based upon the 1559 edition, it contained several controversial Roman Catholic elements. Adherence to it was required in order to hold any office in government or the church. As a consequence, over 2,000 preachers, 20% of the total, refused to take the oath and were expelled from the Church of England and therefore lost their homes and incomes. This led to the exclusion of a substantial section of English society for over a century. John Wesley Breedy in England before and after Wesley wrote, the overall result was the near extinction of biblical thinking and conduct amongst most clergy. The church was bereft of prophets and priests and therefore pluralists, time servers, place seekers and moderate men occupied their places. When the authorities found that the faithful expelled pastors continued to meet with their spiritual flocks in private houses, the state responded with the Conventicle Act of 1664. This banned religious gatherings of more than five people, other than their immediate family, from convening outside the auspices of the Church of England. Despite this, courageous congregations followed their pastors to listen to sermons on hillsides or in other outdoor places. From small beginnings, these field assemblies, or conventicles, were to grow into major problems of public order for the government. 
When the Great Plague of 1665 killed one in five Londoners, most of the official clergy moved out for the fresh air of the country. But the true shepherds of the flock, different expelled Puritan pastors, moved back in to help the sick and dying. Some even returned to conduct services in the churches where they had previously served. This caused an even more vicious backlash from the authorities who in that same year passed the notorious Five Mile Act. This forbade clergy from living within five miles of a parish from which they had been expelled, unless they swore an oath never to resist the king or attempt to alter the government of church or state. If the dissenting pastors broke this law, they faced a penalty of £40 and six months imprisonment. This state opposition to biblical Christianity had tragic consequences for the country. A spiritually weakened national church was in no place to challenge the influence of the Enlightenment and deism which rejected divine revelation and relied on reason. Nor were they positioned to oppose the evils of the slave trade which flourished following the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. Clergy were corrupted with bishops living lives of luxury. The numbers of Christian students at Oxford and Cambridge declined. It was perhaps no surprise that by 1738, Bishop Berkeley declared that religion and morality in Britain had collapsed to a degree that was never before known in any Christian country. All was not lost, however. The Great Ejection, as it became known, laid the foundations of nonconformist Christianity for the following centuries. Among the ejected pastors were Dr. Samuel Annesley and John Wesley, the grandfathers and Dr. Bartholomew Wesley, the great-grandfather of the famous 18th century evangelist. As restrictive laws were gradually lifted and as the fires of the Methodist revival spread, a great movement of spiritual, moral, social and economic transformation arose and affected not only the UK but America and many nations of the world. The sobering story of the battles and conquests of our faithful spiritual ancestors should inspire us to make full use of all our religious freedoms. But we must also be on guard against groups and governments who would seek to act in repressive ways. Caesarea is an important site in Christian history. It was here that Pontius Pilate lived at the time of Jesus and where Peter met a Roman centurion, Cornelius and his household were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Philip, the evangelist, also lived in Caesarea with his four daughters who prophesied. And it was here that the Apostle Paul was under house arrest for two years before he was sent to stand trial before Caesar. Caesarea is an ancient port and administrative city on the Mediterranean coast of present-day Israel, south of Haifa. Originally an ancient Phoenician settlement, it was rebuilt and enlarged by Herod the Great, King of Judea under the Romans, and renamed for his patron, the Emperor Caesar Augustus. The city became the capital of the Roman province of Judea in 6 BC and for 500 years was the capital of the Roman administration in Palestine. According to the first century historian Flavius Josephus, the Jewish revolt against Rome, which culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD, was touched off by an incident at Caesarea in 66 AD. The city's prisons saw the torture and execution of many captive Jewish zealots. In AD 70, the Roman general Vespasian was crowned emperor here. The Crusaders captured the city in 1101 and during the next 200 years frequently changed hands. Muslim forces took control in 1265 and again in 1291. Over the centuries, successive rulers pillaged Caesarea. Today, however, it's one of Israel's major tourist attractions. And in 2020, Caesarea was named by Travel and Leisure as the best tourist spot in the Middle East. The site has been restored and is one of Israel's most attractive and fascinating archaeological sites. Impressive remains of an extensive 6 mile or 10 kilometer aqueduct run along the beach of the north of Caesarea just as they did when the Romans built the aqueduct in the middle of the first century to bring water to the city from Mount Carmel. Looking at the relaxed sunbathers on the beautiful beaches of Caesarea, it is hard to believe that just nearby, so many years ago, the Apostle Paul faced such hard times as he faithfully proclaimed the gospel en route to Rome. Hi everyone, we're Mike and Natasha and it's a privilege to speak to all of you watching online. 
The phrase speak truth to power is increasingly popular today as individuals and pressure groups lobby governments, businesses, schools and universities and other institutions to adopt their way of thinking. Christians also have a responsibility to speak truth to powers and authorities. Being a follower of Jesus and disciple of Jesus involves more than just going to church. It means being a citizen of the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, a new world order which affects every area of life. The standards and teachings of the righteous kingdom of God will always challenge the motivations, expectations and behaviour of the kingdoms of this world with all their different power centres and structures. Now as a couple we have worked to serve God both in the church and also for more than a decade in politics. We've seen on many occasions the reality that former senior White House aide Charles Coulson described in his book Kingdoms in Conflict. He wrote, Never before has the conflict between church and state been so widespread or has such far-reaching implications for every citizen. There have come times in politics often unexpected when it was necessary for us to stand up for our belief in Jesus Christ and speak out about our Christian faith. History shows us that the bigger the challenges to the gospel from the state, the braver the stand you must take to speak truth to power. Famously, it was just one man who, in 1521, stood up for Christ against a whole empire. The Holy Roman Emperor, who controlled a population of over 20 million people, called the German monk Martin Luther to trial for his writings which inspired the Protestant Reformation across Europe. Having already been excommunicated by the Pope, Luther was brought before the political authority of Emperor Charles V to recant his writings. Stating that his conscience was bound by the word of God, he refused to do so and declared, Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me, amen. 500 years later, it's evident how significantly Luther's declaration of his Christian faith altered the course of history and Western civilization. Well, you and I might not have to take on a whole empire, but at some point or another, every one of us will be called upon to speak up about our faith to people in power. It may be your boss or someone at school or university, an authority figure in the community, in your family, or you may even have to appear before judges and speak to government officials and royalty. In our studies in the book of Acts, we see how the Apostle Paul was constantly involved in collisions between the secular world and the kingdom of God. We see this in Acts 19 with the city-wide riots in Ephesus where the business people stirred up violent opposition against the gospel. It's evident also when the Roman military authorities had to rescue Paul and bring him to Caesarea in Acts 23. Today we will see how during his two years under house arrest in Caesarea, Paul had to interact with the powers that be. He was brought before two Roman governors and a Jewish king and queen and needed to defend himself against the accusations of the Jewish high priest, elders and lawyers. Three whole chapters of Acts 24, 25 and 26 are given over to reporting in these events. So speaking to power is clearly a significant issue. So how did Paul speak to these powers whilst before them as their prisoner? We see some important lessons which will help us. Firstly, just as Paul did, we must speak with respect. The Apostle Paul understood that the governing authorities of the world come from God. In Romans 13, 1-2, he explains, The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. After being accused in Acts 24, verse 5, of being a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world, and hearing the charges of the high priest, elders, and lawyers against him, Paul didn't speak from a place of anger or frustration. Instead, he said to Governor Felix in verse 10, I know that for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. Paul respectfully makes his defence from verse 11, declaring that he has done nothing to warrant the accusations against him. And he demonstrates this respect repeatedly when on trial before rulers and authorities. In Acts 26 verses 2 to 3, he addresses King Agrippa saying, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen patiently to me. Even when rudely interrupted by Festus in verse 24, shouting, You're out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you insane. Paul respectfully responds, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. Paul replied, What I'm saying is true and reasonable. Many times people don't speak to those in authority with respect. Rather, there's so much cynicism and nastiness. 
In the UK recently, after the murder of Sir David Amos, members of Parliament across all parties have been speaking out about the regular death threats and aggression they're subjected to, and Jewish MPs have spoken of the anti-Semitic abuse they receive. As Christians, God wants us to speak to authority in a different way. God wants there to be order, not anarchy in the world, and he wants the same in families and the church. Paul states in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And God established the authorities on earth to bring order to the earth. And so he wants us as Christians to really lead the way in speaking respectfully to government, to pastors, to parents, and others in positions of power. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Paul was ready to share his testimony and to do so respectfully, and we must be too. We should never be afraid to speak up, but we should always do so in the right way. When we treat others with respect, doors open, situations change, and we are recognised as different from others who are negative and cynical. As Nelson Mandela said, it never hurts to think too highly of a person. Often they become ennobled and act better because of it. Secondly, we should speak confidently. Paul always spoke with confidence and there was no fear in him. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Paul knew that being a disciple of Jesus gave him the confidence and authority to speak to anyone, no matter how difficult the situation. When sending out the 12 disciples in Matthew 10, 17 to 18, Jesus had warned them, Be on your guard, you will be handed over to the local councils and to be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But in Acts 1, 8, he also promised the disciples would be equipped, saying you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So Paul, having already experienced floggings and imprisonment, was not intimidated when brought before governors and kings, as Jesus said would happen. And so, like Paul, we must have no fear of your audience. When Paul stood before King Agrippa, his wife, Queen Bernice, and the high-ranking military officers and prominent men of the city. He knew this was a man whose great-grandfather had tried to kill Jesus as a baby. His grandfather had John the Baptist beheaded and his father had martyred the first apostle, James. So Paul was in no doubt how nasty things could get for him. Those accusing Paul wanted him killed and the Roman governors had the power to do just that. In the Roman Empire, a governor was the province's chief judge who alone had the right to impose capital punishment. To appeal to a governor's decision meant travelling to Rome and presenting your case before the emperor himself, as we later see Paul in fact does. Governor Felix was not a righteous man. It actually says in Acts 24-26 he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. And Acts 25 explains how Governor Festus was very close with the chief priests and the Jewish leaders who were out to take Paul's life. In fact, they requested Festus as a favour to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem for they were preparing to ambush to kill him. And in verse 9, Festus showed that he was willing to use his authority to hand over Paul's life to them. Yet like Paul, we cannot be fearful when we stand in front of people in authority. Jesus instructed in Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. As Paul spoke with the confidence that comes from being a true disciple of Jesus, the spiritual authority he carried was greater than the earthly power of the governor. Acts 24, 25 tells us that as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. And 1 John 4, 1 promises, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So speak confidently without fear of your audience. Also have no fear of the arguments against you. We read in Acts 25, 7 that when Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. In Revelation 12, 11 says, we triumph by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Never shy away from confidently telling your testimony out of fear of what people might say. And like Paul, we should have no fear of the future. 
Having spoken boldly before his many accusers so far, Paul was fearless about stating his faith in Jesus even before the Roman Emperor declaring in Acts 25.11, I appeal to Caesar. Paul also states in Acts 26.17 that God had promised him, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. He knew God had his future in hand and as he later wrote in 2 Timothy 1.7 that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Are you fearful about what others might think of you, say about you or use the authority to do to you if you were to speak about your faith in Jesus? 1 John 4.18 tells us that there is no fear in love but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Paul personally knew God's perfect love for him and was not afraid to speak to whichever earthly authority God wanted, no matter the potential consequences. So when you're speaking to authority, do not be intimidated and do not shrink back. Like Paul, speak to authority with confidence in the Lord. Finally, we see how Paul demonstrates that we must always speak faithfully. Paul was always a faithful witness to Christ, whoever he was speaking to, and we must always be faithful with our words as well. Yes, we must be faithful in our speech in general, as Jesus instructs in Matthew 5:37, let your yes be yes and your no, no. But more specifically, we must always be speaking faithfully of Jesus. Before Gentile rulers and Jewish royalty alike, Paul faithfully declared the truth of the gospel, repeatedly sharing his testimony. In Acts 24, 14, Paul says to Governor Felix, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way. In Acts 25, 19, Festus explains to King Agrippa that Paul was on trial about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. We see in Acts 26 that Paul's primary concern was to personally share the good news of Jesus, repeatedly calling Agrippa by name and explaining how he could receive forgiveness of sins and a place amongst those who are sanctified by faith. Paul never missed an opportunity to testify to small and great alike. He was faithful to share his testimony and the life-changing power of an encounter with Jesus. Throughout Acts, we see that Paul didn't let anything stop him from telling others about Jesus, whether he was being beaten and flogged, imprisoned, or having attempts made on his life. And in verse 29, he faithfully declares to King Agrippa, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We too cannot be ashamed of the gospel. We must speak faithfully of God and the teachings of the word of God and must always speak faithfully of Jesus. Despite the relentless charges that were brought against Paul, the secular and political authorities to which he spoke each acknowledged that he was not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Yet the Lord still allowed him to be on trial before these people and to have the opportunity to spread the fire of the gospel both in prisons and palaces. So today, like the Apostle Paul, no matter your circumstances, it's determined that when your moment comes, you will speak respectfully, confidently and faithfully to those in authority. Never miss an opportunity to spread the good news of the love of Jesus. For as Psalm 25 verse 3 encourages us, no one who trusts in the Lord will ever be put to shame. Today, do you truly know the great love of Jesus that can drive out all fear from your heart? John 3, 16 to 17 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Maybe you've heard about Jesus but never really experienced his great love for you. Today your life can be powerfully changed and it begins when you pray this prayer. Please pray with us now. Lord Jesus, today I recognise how much I need you in my life. Jesus, please come into my heart and be Lord of my life from now on. Today I ask that you forgive me from all my sins. Please give me a new identity as a child of God so that I can experience your great love, your power and your presence in my life every day. Thank you for your love that removes all fear from my life. And from today I can live in total freedom because of your death and resurrection on the cross. Amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, then we welcome you into the family of God. Please contact us so we can connect with you and help you as you grow in your Christian faith.
And for those watching who are Christians, the Lord wants to set you free from any fear of speaking out about your faith. It's time to stop avoiding speaking to authority and to receive a new anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's time to receive this anointing for it's only the Holy Spirit who will enable you to speak the right words in any situation and boldly share the love of Jesus wherever you go. Romans 8.17 says that we are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Therefore, like the Apostle Paul, you also carry the authority of being a child of God. Maybe you need to have a fresh revelation today of the love that God has for you and that even in the most challenging circumstances, he will never abandon you. Please close your eyes and pray from your heart with us now. Dear Lord, thank you for the great example of the Apostle Paul and how he used every opportunity to share the gospel. Today we want to thank you that you're speaking to each one of us and preparing us for when we too will have the opportunities to speak your words to those in authority. Let us never attempt this in our own strength, Lord, but know that as your children, when we come under your authority and carry that authority with us, even into the most challenging situations, you will always help us. We pray now for a fresh touch of your love to come over every person watching. It's only your love, Lord, that drives out all fear and enables us to speak words of faith. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll anoint each person now with a new level of faith so that they will boldly share the gospel of Jesus more and more. Use us, we pray, to speak to any and every person you're sending us to. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and for your glory, Lord. Amen. Now let's worship the Lord with our final song.
At the cross the work is finished You were buried in the ground By the grave could not contain you For you were the Thank you for joining us today. If you have any prayer requests, please contact us at hello at kcionline.org or for more information about our church, please visit our website at kcionline.org. To stay connected with us, please go to kcionline.org forward slash connect. Or if you'd like to find out more about giving, please go to kcionline.org forward slash giving. And to listen to all our services, go to kcionline.org forward slash podcast or simply download the KCI app on the App Store. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel of King's Church International and our senior pastors Wes and Adriana Richards. We welcome you to join us again every Sunday at 5pm UK time. God bless you.